ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਸੋ ਵੀ ਸਟਾਰਟ ਦੀ ਫਾਈਨਲ ਵਰਸ ਬੋਡੀ 38 ਵਿਦਨ ਦਾ ਜਪਜੀ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਕੰਪੋਜੀਸ਼ਨ and we've been through the five stages of spiritual development the five states that guru nanak has talked about on the path on the journey but what do you do when you've learnt all the stages of spiritual growth as you the listener come to the end of this particular commentary on the japji sahib where will you go from here you start on the path of that taram khand with hope with optimism but as you see the sheer scale of the journey that guru nanak has outlined with saram khand with karam khand and then finally with sach khand then when you realize the scale of that journey ahead of you it can be a little bit daunting it can leave you a little bit despondent how do you deal with the knowledge that you don't exist but with the experience that you live within the ego every day when you live as the individual when the ego is still there when you live your every day with your self identity what do you do so in this final verse guru nanak dev ji talks directly to you the ego the self and talks to you and your role on this journey in the five stages of the spiritual journey the last stage in which the ego existed was saram khand that stage where you have to get up and do something the effort that state of endeavor so guruji now goes back to that state to clarify what exactly do you need to do what role do you the ego have to perform after that awakening of gyan khand once you have an understanding we realize that there's still work to be done knowledge is never going to be enough there is effort that still needs to be performed now even in saram khand we identified that efforts have already been talked about throughout japji sahib starting with this idea of amrit vela and then guruji goes in detail in the four verses that end with ades this are ades the verses 28 to 31 where guruji identifies lots of different endeavors and remember that verse started with munda santok saram patjoli with having contentment disciplines guruji describes all of these qualities of living a saintly life self restraint trust universal brotherhood compassion oneness so those verses the bodies 28 to 31 talked about what the qualities are of just living a saintly godly life here in this final verse guru nanak dev ji specifically talks about what efforts you need to do to progress on this journey and how do you build up and how do you build upon those efforts like compassion like trust how do you build on those and guru explained that after gyan khand after awakening was the effort and guruji specifically said that the effort was to do something 
to transform the mind. With your jnana, with the wisdom, the effort is to change, transform, to revitalize our own thinking. And in Saram Khand, Guruji says, Tithe kariya surt mat man bud. So here, awareness, identity and intelligence within the mind get shaped and formed. So the key to discarding the ego lies in reforming our minds. The question is, how can it be done? What are the steps that we need to take? What's the tools that we have at our disposal? What's the right environment? What are the circumstances that we need to undergo this transformation? So let's take an example. Imagine that you were going to renovate an old classic car. Imagine that you're going to transform an old classic car that you've bought. Assuming that you've done your research, assuming that you have all the skills that you need to start the project, the first thing that you might do is to set up a workshop, set up a space to actually do the work, to do the effort. Perhaps you might clear your garage to make that space. And then you need to make sure that you have all the tools, the time and the skills so that you can get the job done. And Guru Nanak Dev Ji uses a similar example here. Guruji uses the example of a workshop of a goldsmith where he's taking raw gold and minting them into precious coins. So Guru starts by saying, Jat Pahara Tiraj Sunayar. So the word Jat is restraint, self-restraint, self-control. And if jat is self-restraint, then somebody who practices that control is known as a jati. In the Sodar body of Japji Sahib number 27, we heard the line Gavan Jati Sati Santoki. So the songs being sung at the door of the divine are being sung by the Jati, the self controlled, the charitable, and the Santoki, the contented ones. So that's the meaning of Jat self control, self restraint. Bahara means specifically the workshop of a metallurgist, somebody who works with metals. And generally there are a few types of metallurgists. We talk about the, what, those who work with precious metals. They're known as sunyar, being gold workers, and luhar being the ones who work with steel and iron. So specifically we're talking about the workshop is the environment that Guruji first starts talking about and the environment of a sunyar. Guruji starts by saying, Jat Pahara, establish a workshop of self-control. So if we want to reform the mind, the environment within which the mind can be transformed is an environment of self-control and restraint. So this work is never going to be carried out in the Gurdwara, in the church, in the temple, in the mosque. Because the transformation of the mind is happening within you, then that environment within which it has to happen is also within you. You have to make yourself into a workshop of self-control, of restriction. So within yourself, create the environment of self-discipline and restraint. And Jat specifically means controlling your senses, your five senses. So how do we control our five senses? 
let's remind ourselves what we're talking about. In the Indian tradition, we say that there are five Gyan Indriya, but there are also five Karam Indriya. Indriya mean these senses or your organs. So your five Gyan Indriya are the five senses that we also know in English, which is sight, hearing, smell, touch and taste. These are your Gyan Indriya. These are the senses with which you have an understanding of the world around you. But your five Karam Indriya are the ones that allow you to do actions. So those are two arms, two legs and a tongue. Your arms allow you to perform actions. Your legs allow you to perform certain actions and you can perform certain actions just with your speech. But we also have this idea of Panj Vikar, five vices, which are your calm, your lust, krodh, your anger, lobh, your greed, mo, your attachment, and hankar, your pride, your self-importance. So jat is a control of all of these things. Typically, in the Indian tradition, it was seen as pious and saintly to become what is known as Brahmacharya, which is a celibate. And even today within the Sikh tradition, you will have saints who are titled as Bihangam, never get married, celibate. But Jat doesn't mean control in that instance. What Guru Nanak Dev Ji is talking about isn't about celibacy because the Gurus themselves practiced Grist Jeevan. The Gurus themselves were married. The Gurus themselves had children. So here Jat isn't talking about becoming a renunciate. This is something that is applicable to the family person. To you in your normal everyday life, how do you control your senses? So the primary instruction here is to control your senses, to control your vices. Now if we think about our spiritual journeys, sometimes we can feel a little bit lost. We can wonder why when we're performing our rituals, when we're doing our spiritual rules and regulations, when we're following all those things, why it isn't working, why aren't we progressing? Why are those religious duties not enough? What is the obstacle? What's the barrier? What's the thing that isn't working? The obstacle always has been the mind. That's always been our obstacle. Now, while modern society has taught us to celebrate the great achievements of the mind and modern society celebrates the limitless nature of the mind, it's always focused on this as the uniqueness of the human species. But what we've done is that we haven't understood that the limitless nature of the mind has also come with some baggage. So, of course, the mind is the pride and glory of the human being. But what your mind is doing is it's also stopping you from realizing your connection with this oneness. So, although the mind is an amazing tool, it's also blocking you in certain ways. So, why has that happened? The reason it's happened is because within your mind, you've fallen in love with the world around you. You've fallen in love with your body and the mind has fallen in love with itself. So we've created an attachment to the world and to our body-mind identity. We can call that Maya. We can summarize all of that as being Maya. The mind has fallen in love with it. And by doing so, it's made you forget who you are. And because we love our identity, because we've fallen in love with our body, because we've fallen in love with our mind, we now do whatever we can to sustain that identity. We now feed that identity. 
And how do we do this? What we do is we spend as much time as possible running after happiness. And the way we run after happiness is by indulging in all the pleasures that the world has to offer the body and all the pleasures that the mind can take. That's what we spend all of our time doing. That's how we define happiness. Our happiness is defined by how much we can indulge ourselves in. And so while these pleasures are there, what we've done is we've engaged in our panj vikar. We've engaged in our lust, in our anger, in our greed, in our attachments and in our self-pride because ultimately these are pleasurable. As much as we may learn that these things are somehow vices, somehow they're negative, our experience of them is ultimately that they serve us. They give us some pleasure, some joy. Even anger makes us feel right, makes us feel superior. Even greed makes us feel self-worthy. So they make us feel important. And by doing that, what they're doing is they're feeding this self-identity. We've created a cycle. The cycle is that we love our identity and then we feed our identity with pleasures. And the more that we enjoy those pleasures, the more it feeds our identity, the more we self-identify with the body and we identify with the mind. This is a cycle that now needs to be broken. All of this free reign that we've given our mind to do whatever it wants, the free reign that we've given our body to do whatever it wants, this has created our sense of separation. The pleasure of the senses has created our sense of separation. And the Guru wants to reconnect you. The Guru wants to make you whole again. The most important question is, do you want that for yourself? Have you had enough of your own indulgences? Has the time arrived for you to transcend the temporary body, the temporary pleasures? Remember that these pleasures have always been temporary. Nothing that you've engaged in has given you everlasting happiness. But because it runs out, we feel like we are validated in running after it again because we need to somehow sustain that. It's become a drug. We get a high from it and then it wears off and then we've got to run after it again. The question is, are you ready to end that cycle? Have you had enough? Are you ready to move into this ultimate, permanent euphoria of where you came from. With this idea, the mind starts to feel challenged. And the challenge of the mind is that the pleasures of the senses feel quite gratifying. And not only are they gratifying, they give us instant gratification. And somehow the idea of divine union and merging with the oneness seems like the satisfaction is somewhere far away. It seems to delay the reward. So why is your mind going to go after something which feels really far away when in reality it says, well, the world is giving me instant pleasures right now. My body, my mind is giving me instant pleasures right now. Why would I want to give that up? And this is where we haven't understood what the Guru is offering. What we've done is we like to think of Gurmat as a religion where we have to follow some rules and we do them in the hope that there is some reward either at the end of this life or in some sort of afterlife. 
But what the Guru has always offered right from the beginning, at each step of the way, is instant happiness, instant contentment and bliss. But our way of thinking and understanding Gurmat has not allowed us to experience it in that way. So what we do is we haven't really trusted the Guru's method because we haven't understood what the Guru is trying to say. And although we pay a little bit of lip service to the Guru, in reality we've followed our own path. We've taken bits of the Guru that we understand and the bits that we don't understand, we've rejected it. We've followed our own path all this time. But what we haven't realized is our path constantly leads us to one destination, which is suffering. No matter where we go in our own personal journey, in our own method of pursuing happiness, we've always come towards suffering. No matter how we've tried to pursue happiness, suffering has always been there. So our way of thinking, manmat rather than gurmat, has left us vulnerable and totally exposed. And it leaves us completely incapable of dealing with suffering. And suffering comes from not knowing how to deal with the uncertainty of life. We think life is going to go a certain way and life always has a way of doing something else. And we don't have a way of dealing with that. Our minds and our way of thinking hasn't come up with a solution towards that. Now the question you have to ask yourself is, do you really want a way out of that? Or are you actually happy within this prison of ego? Have you made yourself quite comfortable here that actually you don't need to go anywhere? If you're ready to break this cycle, then this pleasure and self-identification method needs to be broken. Now the question is, there are so many pleasures, where do we begin? There are only five senses, but the pleasures of those five senses are never-ending. You know, every time we have a, um, an election, you hear all the political parties come up with new policies, new pledges, and what do they do? They write themselves a manifesto. And what that manifesto is, is a promise to the people that this is what we're going to commit to. So in this final verse, it's now time for you to write your own personal manifesto. What pleasures are you indulging your five senses in? What sights, what sounds, what smells, what tastes, what physical sensations have you fallen in love with? And are there any other negative behaviors, any vices that you want to be free from? What do you already know deep down within your heart is holding you back? And you may have several improvements that you want to make within yourself, and that's okay. Today, take some time to write them down. Whether you have a pen or paper handy, or you write it down on your phone. Remember, we're writing about spiritual barriers and spiritual improvements, so we don't want to write down anything about material success. Not about getting a new job or starting new hobbies, improving your diet or getting more money in life. Spend some time today to write down what are going to be your pledges, your policies, your promises to fix the things that you already know need to be fixed within yourself. And when you can write them down and when you can see them clearly in front of you in black and white, 
know that these answers have been there all the time. They're already inside you. But you've already known that these problems have existed, yet you convinced yourself that you weren't the problem. These weren't the problem, the problem was somewhere else. That the problem was because God was too far away, unreachable. So we know within ourselves what needs to change, but we've convinced ourselves that the problem is something else and it needs some other solution. And this is the perception that we've created within ourselves. You've convinced yourself that you're right to act in the way that you already do. Like you deserve all these pleasures. That you're okay with all of the vices that you live with. This is the self-perception that we've created. And how do we explain that? Well, this is who I am. This is who I am. And I'm okay with it. So all this time, you've been following your own path. You've not been following the Guru's path. And the Guru is here to show us that we have to adopt the Guru's method in order to succeed. Our methods have failed. The Guru wants you to follow a method that will succeed. So, now that you have a list, now that you know what needs to be improved, wouldn't it be great to have all those problems resolved right away? Wouldn't it be great to have all the barriers in your life lifted? The Guru goes on to say, Jat Pahara Tiraj Sunayar. The word Tiraj means patience or persistence. And Guru says that the Sunyar, the goldsmith, is patience. If self-restraint is the workshop, then patience is the goldsmith. He's the worker, the one running things. What's the role of a goldsmith? What does a goldsmith do? It takes raw gold, raw materials, melts them down, purifies them, removes the impurities, and then reshapes the gold, molds it into something valuable, into coins or jewelry. And remember, we're also talking about a similar process, about purifying and molding your mind. And this is going to take time, and it's going to take perseverance. So this tiraj, this perseverance, is the manager of the whole process. And what that means is regardless of whatever circumstances happens in your life, regardless of any events of happiness or sorrow, you have to be steadfast in your pursuit of spiritual progression in your life. Don't let obstacles derail you. Tiraj means to carry on regardless. With patience and not that at the first sign of trouble you go back to your old way of living. It means to be unaffected by pain or pleasure, by the ups and downs of life. So tiraj can be extended to mean having an impartiality towards life, being dispassionate towards life. So this impartiality towards the circumstances in your life is the manager. It manages the whole process of cultivating a life of universal realization. So if you look at your list 
rather than thinking about all of the problems that you might want to be fixing, rather than feeling as though you're a long way away from your goal, look at your list and just pick one thing that you're going to start working on today. Every time you make a change in your life, it's going to empower you to make the next change. This is what that patience means. You don't get disheartened by looking at your list. You pick something and you start working on that. You empower yourself because for the first time you're actually writing it down and saying, I need to do this. And when you make a change, you'll see that you will feel more empowered to make further changes to improve your life and to refine your mind further. Guruji goes on to say, Eherana mat ved hathiyar. Eheran is anvil. And Guru is saying, an anvil like intellect. Eherana mat ved hathiyar. An anvil like intellect, knowledge, the hammer. So an anvil is a heavy block of iron which hot metals are placed on and are hammered on. So Guru is saying, let your thinking become an anvil upon which the hammer of divine wisdom can be beaten on. So here the Guru's words are beginning to sound quite drastic. To let knowledge be beaten and drummed into your mind. And we like to think that the intellect that we've used in our life so far has been our own. How we use that intellect is that we've been living a life that we can try and think of as many different ways to create our own happiness. That's how we've used our intellect. Any way that we feel will bring us happiness, we try and come up with those ideas. But the reality is that your psychological state is not your own. The way of living that you've chosen, the way of thinking that you've adopted isn't actually your own. We've relied quite heavily on our upbringing and conditioning by society. So society has actually formed most of our own opinions. So our intellect has been conditioned. And still, because the voice in our head sounds like us, we like to think that those thoughts are our own. And when we talk about discarding our own thoughts and adopting something new, then people start getting quite scared. People think that religion is going to brainwash us into some sort of cult-like mentality. And while there are examples of that in the world, this is not what the Guru is trying to do with us. The Guru identifies that our current state of thinking hasn't helped us. If we've been trying to find happiness, the Guru identifies that our way of mind hasn't helped us find that happiness that we've all been searching for in life. So what the Guru is offering is a more refined philosophy of living. One that better understands the human condition and one that better understands the mind. In the sixth body, Guru Nanak Dev Ji revealed that within the intellect is contained a jewel-like experience. Mat Ratana Jawahar Manak. Within the intellect are gems, jewels and rubies. But how do we find those? If the Guru is saying that it's already there within us, what's the method that we need to reveal these? The Guru in that same line goes on to say, If you listen to the teachings of the Guru, if the 
lessons of the Guru are heard and applied, then the jewel-like experience of the mind will manifest itself. And here the Guru is saying something very similar. Aharana mat ved hathyar. You'll notice the word ved has an onkar underneath it, which means the word ved is singular. And traditionally, there are four Vedas of the Hindu tradition, the four Vedas. So here, this isn't referring to those four Vedas because we can look at the spelling being a singular word. So here the word Ved just means spiritual knowledge, divine understanding, the supreme final message of spiritual wisdom. It doesn't mean the Vedas, it means knowledge. So Ehran Mat, make your mind the anvil upon which the knowledge can be hammered on. So how do we utilize the Guru's teachings? How do we reveal the jewel of the mind? How do we listen? How do we apply the Guru's message? We apply it by making our mind receptive. Ehran Mat. What does an anvil do? How do we make our mind like an anvil? If you think about an ironmonger, a metal worker, hammering, molding, shaping metal on the anvil, the anvil throughout the process stays stable. It doesn't waver, it doesn't move. It just stays there and it takes all the beatings. So it doesn't move while being hit by the hammer. And in the same way, our mind should not move when being hit by the wisdom of the Guru. It has to remain stable and steadfast and continually serve and allow itself to be receptive to this wisdom. So when we've asked all the questions, when we've tried to rationalize and understand what the Guru is trying to say, all the different concepts, the time is right to actually follow the teachings as instructed. Now let's take the example as though the Guru was a personal trainer, a trainer of some physical sport or martial art, some sort of physical discipline. If we had a personal trainer and the personal trainer instructs us to move in a certain way, to do a certain maneuver or a certain action, we would readily follow that straight away. Because we have an impression within ourselves that that instruction is going to benefit us, is going to serve us in some way. If we are here to learn how to become proficient in that sport, in that martial art, any move that you teach me is going to help me become better at performing that. But for some reason, with the Guru's wisdom, we're not able to accept the Guru's instruction so easily, so readily. We're not, we find it much harder to apply the same principles. And that's because we've made Sikhi into a religion with an end goal rather than an immediate benefit. If the personal trainer gives you a move, you feel straight away, I've learned something new. And that something new is part of what I'm here to learn. But when the Guru gives you an instruction, we feel like the benefit is far away. There isn't some immediate benefit. So we feel justified in rejecting the endeavors the saram, the efforts that the Guru has recommended. And so we have to begin to understand how should we listen to the Guru? How should we apply the Guru's teaching? How do we take on this idea of restraint, of discipline? Having an anvil-like mind means to accept no matter what our mind thinks, no matter if our mind understands that teaching, 
we all know the, the famous scene within a great film, The Karate Kid. The teacher instructs the student to paint the fence. The, f the student doesn't understand why. But only later on does the student realize that that particular action was beneficial. And as long as we don't understand what the Guru is doing, we feel justified in saying that instruction is not right for me. Because we can't see the immediate benefit. The Guru is giving you immediate benefit, but because our mind hasn't understood it, we reject that. So having an anvil-like mind means to just take it, to accept it, to be there and let the Guru do what the Guru is here to do. Let the trainer train you. Don't you be the obstacle to your own learning. And so the first instruction that the Guru has said is we need to adopt discipline, self-control. Now, if you look back at your list of things that you want to improve in your life, there's a very high probability that this isn't the first time that you've tried to improve that thing. This isn't the first time that you've tried to improve yourself. Some of us have made many previous attempts to make a change in our life, but we've always fallen back, back into our old ways. Why does this happen? What do we need to sustain our discipline? What do we need to allow us to persevere? Guru goes on to say, Pa khala agana tap tau. Fear is the bellows, the flame is discipline. With fear as the bellows, fan the flames of discipline, taptao. We've come across this word taptao before, where Guruji talks about asank puja, asank taptao. There are countless worships and countless austerities, difficult methods of worship. Tap means doing some difficult meditation, difficult postures as was common in India at the time. People felt that in order to be spiritual you had to stand on one leg for many years, you had to go into silence and not say anything, you could lie on a bed of kneels and you, you had to prove your worthiness for enlightenment. So the word tap means a difficult physical method of worship and tao means actions or efforts. Interestingly, the word Tao also means blaze or heat. So you could think that Agan Tap Tao, that the word Tao means blaze or heat, that's related to Agan. So Guru is using this analogy of a metal worker having a hammer, having an anvil, but also having somewhere to melt that metal and that metal needs to be melted using hot flames and a furnace. So you could think the word Tao means blaze or heat and in fact if we look at one of the oldest commentaries on Guru Granth Sahib which is the Frid Kortika that actually uses Tao in that particular way. But when we look at how Gurbani has spelt the word tap, we can notice that tap is missing an ankar. If the word tap just meant doing hard work, it would have to have an ankar. If tau was related to the fire, if tau meant the blaze, then tap would have to have an ankar because tap would be a self contained word. The fact that tap doesn't have an ankar means that we have to link tap to the next word, which is tau. So tap tau we know means efforts to doing hard discipline. 
So let's go back to our analogy. What's the Guru saying? In any fire, in any furnace, when air is blown into that fire, it significantly improves the fire, increases the flames and increases the temperature. By blowing hot air or cold air or blowing oxygen into that flame, it increases the flame. So the flame is really important in any furnace. In this analogy that the Guru is using, the flame is the bedrock of the whole process. If you want to take raw metal and convert it into some sort of jewel, the only way to do it is to utilize a flame. So if discipline is the flame, tap tao, then fear is the thing that motivates the flame. Pao kala agan tap tao. Think about the analogy. There is a flame, but something is keeping that flame burning, keeping it bright, keeping it alive. Guruji is saying, Pao kala. Fear is that pipe that is blowing into the furnace of discipline. So if you want to keep yourself motivated in being steadfast in your spiritual development, if you want to keep the flames of discipline alive, Guru is saying that we need to blow that flame with fear. That's what's going to keep that flame alive. That's what's going to keep it burning. And the reason we don't follow through with our discipline is because we don't understand the consequences of not following through. We're not afraid of the consequences. In fact, the whole world has abandoned dharam because of a lack of fear. Because we've convinced ourselves that with our free will, with our own thinking, comes our own freedom. And while free will does free you from the concept of some supernatural, high, almighty being, your free will hasn't adequately helped you deal with suffering within the mind. Letting your mind just do whatever it wants hasn't led to a happy mind. So this should be your fear, that if you don't follow the Guru, if you go back into your mind's way of thinking, your mind has always led you to suffering. That should be your fear. That should be the reason that says, I need to follow what the Guru is saying, because I can't trust my mind anymore. So we're not fearful of some punishing God. That's not what we're talking about. Rather, we fear the consequences of our failure. We should fear the consequences of our vices. Not from punishment, but from the suffering that they inflict upon us. And the suffering that our vices inflict on others as well. Your lust, your anger, your greed, your attachment, your pride. These are harming you and these are harming the people around you. And they steal something beautiful from within you. They're stealing an inner happiness that's already there. They're stealing a serenity within you. They steal your inner serenity. So maintain your discipline by combating these behaviors. Know that if you don't follow through with the Guru's advice, it is only you that suffers. It is only you that is guaranteeing yourself suffering. There's another way to understand fear. When we think about fear, we think about being afraid of someone who is more powerful than us. That kind of fear breeds hatred towards that other person. If you're afraid of someone who's more powerful than you, 
the fear breeds hatred towards that other person. But there's another type of fear, a fear based on love. The fear of lovers. When you're in love, the only fear that you have is being away from the one that you love. So there is a fear that breeds hatred and there is a fear that breeds love, that is born out of love. Just as a lover is afraid of being away from their beloved, that they long to be back in the embrace of, of their loved one, so we have to treat fear in our own lives. If God is the supreme bliss of the universe, then to be away from that bliss is the fear we need to motivate us. If God is bliss, then the fear you need to have is that you are not in your bliss and the Guru's teaching is trying to get you back to your own divine bliss. So take a fear based out of love, not out of hatred. And don't let your discipline die down. Keep the love and the bliss of that oneness in your heart as your motivation. So we need discipline and we need to follow what the Guru has instructed and recommended for us. This isn't about rules, this isn't about rituals. Yes, the Guru recommends Amrit Vela. Yes, the Guru recommends the Nitnim. But it doesn't stop at your Nitnim, it doesn't stop at your Amrit Vela. It doesn't mean that if you do those things, that's enough. You've done what is needed at Saramkhand. Remember, Saram was first mentioned in Pauli 28. And there, there were a, a huge list of characteristics and qualities around contentment, around trust around treating everyone with a universal brotherhood. We have to build upon those characteristics. So, Saram Khand, the discipline that you need to have is a discipline of your character, discipline of your mind, discipline of your vices, of thinking sweet things, of speaking in a sweet way, having a softness, Remember, we're talking about melting metal. If you take something rigid and hard, your discipline is a flame that's softening you, that's melting you, that's turning something cold and hard into something warm and soft. And in the same way, we have to take the rigidity of our mind how we deal with ourselves, how we deal with others and make it into a loving, soft mind that it can be moulded by our discipline. If your discipline is hardening your mind, is increasing your ego, is making you think how great you are, then it isn't a flame that is melting your mind. It isn't a discipline that is moulding you into something beautiful. Remember, Saram Khand create something beautiful. Saram khand ki bani roop. Tithe kaadat kariye bahut anoop. What is created here is of indescribable beauty. Your mind has to be created into something that is so beautiful that you yourself fall in love with the purity of your own mind. The question is, are you ready to take on this challenge? Is the reward of this super consciousness, of this such kind, sweet enough to tempt you? We'll continue with this verse next week. Vaiguru Ji Ka Khalsa, Vaiguru Ji Ki Fateh.